We're excited to be joined by Jimmy Jean from Desjardins. Jimmy, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself to all the Peak viewers? Sure. Uh, well, nice to uh, meet you again. I'm uh, Vice President Chief Economist at Desjardins, so I run the uh, economics uh, department where we do uh, forecasts. We just published our fresh forecast this morning, if you want to take a look on our website. Uh, and so we do all the analysis uh, as it pertains to the global U.S. and Canadian economies. So, Jimmy, how would you characterize the current Canadian economic landscape in 2024, and what are some of your predictions? Well, it's a, a continuation, I think, of what we saw in 2023. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, weakness that uh, follows that, that very rapid uh, rise in interest rates. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we're talking about an economy that's, that's, that's bending, but it's not breaking. So, uh, you know, the uh, assumption at the onset of 2023 was that, you know, uh, global economies were many economies in the advanced world were to experience recessions. And we've kind of seen that in Europe uh, and in Canada. Well, we kind of escaped it largely because of high population growth. So even if on a per capita basis, we see contractions in, in consumer spending and investment, uh, still we've brought in so many people that it's uh, short up the uh, actual GDP. And the U.S. has been really the surprise in 2023 uh, with very strong growth. And that's helped us a little bit in Canada through our exports. So it's it's a mixed picture. But, you know, the weakness, you are seeing the weakness, you're seeing the adjustment. It's not like it's not the final innings of this, uh, the impacts of this rate cycle. And so uh, for a lot of people, it, it creates uh, very difficult conditions right now. The neat thing about doing these economic webinars is we can anchor ourselves back at different points in time. And I remember at the first one we did, it was all about interest rates and that interest rates didn't seem like they were going to stop climbing. It seems like we've plateaued a bit. I'd love to talk to you about your assessment of the current interest rate situation and how it will affect businesses and consumers. Yeah, well, the uh, good news, I guess that's the, the, the best news in all this environment is that you know, more and more conditions are lining up to, uh, towards uh, rate cuts by, by central banks. Now, they're being very prudent, uh, given that, you know, the inflation data can be choppy. Uh, they want to make sure that, you know, all the conditions are, are there. But uh, more and more, they're opening up to the fact that, you know, rate rates at 5%, for example, in the case of Canada, or f nearly 5.5% for the Fed, that doesn't make sense anymore. When you have an inflation basically at, you know, around 3%, Canada, which just had 2.8%. So uh, we think by June, both the Fed, the Bank of Canada, many other central banks for that matter, will start uh, cutting rates, even if uh, gradually. So that will uh, provide some relief. Uh, having said that, uh, rates are going to remain high. They're going to be very gradual in this process. Uh, they're going to be, they're going to want to make sure, particularly in Canada, that the housing market doesn't uh, take off again and creates uh, more problems in terms of affordability. So uh, there's a number of things, of conditions they want uh, to to see established. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to see uh, a little bit lower rates, and that should help support that that sort of recovery, uh, even if it's not a dramatic recovery we're expecting. But you know, it should uh, provide at least uh, better sentiment uh, for consumers, for for businesses in particular. Even among my friends and family, there's a lot of discussions around economic growth and what that might look like in Canada. What are your thoughts on the trajectory of Canada's GDP and its potential challenges or opportunities? Well, you know, GDP is uh, the, the, the you have to look at it, you know, you, you can look at it uh, outright or you can look at it per capita. And, uh, you know, when you look at GDP on per capita basis, it's been contracting. When you look at domestic demand, five of the last six quarters were negative. So uh, that's why uh, I often say, uh, you know, recession is everywhere to be seen, but in the data, because uh, right now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, very strong demographic growth. It was still 3.2% in the first two months of, of the year on a year-over-year -year basis when you look at working age population. So, you know, that uh, very fast demographic expansion masks a lot of weakness uh, under uh, under the hood. Uh, but I think at the same time, uh, like I said, the interest rate cuts will will be helping. And, um, you know, ultimately, it will uh, 
hopefully uh, support uh, stronger business investment because that's been uh, very disappointing in terms of what we've seen. Uh, and if we want to hope for GDP to be sustained, to have stronger potential growth uh, that can create you know, strong jobs, higher wages, we need to get productivity going uh, over the medium term. So um, right now it's been uh, disappointing. Uh, hopefully rate cuts will manage to get things going again. One of the really neat things about economics at large in our conversations is that you get to see some of the topics that we talk about reflected in your day to day life. I think the labor shortage is a good example of that. I remember a few summers ago when Tim Hortons couldn't properly staff themselves and there were huge lines. What are the what's going on with the labor market today? What trends are you re seeing in terms of employment rates and how might they affect the likelihood of a recession? Well, that's another area where as economists, we are challenged to, to look at things differently, because if you look at things outright, you know, the Canadian job market continues to add jobs every month. So it's seemingly not bad. But really, when you consider uh, the demographic expansion, really you find what you find is that the job market is not keeping up with the population expansion. So you're seeing the employment rate uh, fall uh, for uh, you know for the better part of the last year. The employment rate has fallen. So you have more additions than you have uh, uh, appetite to hire right now because the job vacancy rate has returned to where it was pre-pandemic. And so you find a lot of, uh, of newcomers who are, it takes longer to, to be able to find a position. Uh, so, so that's happening uh, ha at the same time. And that's why the economy is bending, not breaking. You're not seeing yet uh, outright declines in employment, massive layoffs. You hear about things here and there, but in the data, we're not seeing that. And it's kind of the same situation across the OECD in Europe, uh, in the US. In the US, it's a different thing. The, the, the labor market is still very strong. But, uh, you know, structurally, the story we've been telling, which is, you know, uh, given the aging of the population, you can't expect the job market to be too weak in this environment. That's really playing out how we, we expect it. And that's good news because it allows for a smooth transition and we're seeing inflation decline. And that's really the good news. You touched upon it a few times in your in your last remarks, but one of the unique features of the Canadian economy is this population growth that we've been seeing. What are some of the factors driving this population growth and how are they influencing the economic landscape? Well, uh, the population uh, expansion is largely through immigration, as we know. Uh, and uh, in the wake of the pandemic, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, uh, business, we, re we reopened the economy as if we would light up a switch, right? But uh, uh, many workers were missing, uh, either because they were uh, uncomfortable returning to work, either because they had, uh, you know, caretaking responsibilities, either because they returned to school or changed careers, say some flight attendants who chose to, you know, given the industry was locked down, chose to, uh, you know, uh, reorient into a, another sector. So you have you had all those transitions uh, that made it such that some uh, sectors that really needed workers couldn't find them. And, and so they resorted to uh, the uh, immigration programs. Uh, there's the temporary foreign worker program, but in particular, the uh, international mobility program, which allows employers to recruit internationally without proving that they're not able to find Canadians uh, suitable for, for the job. So that's really through that channel that we've seen uh, a lot of the immigration taking place, in addition to also uh, uh, students. Uh, now, I think as we speak, uh, there's supposed to be some announcements on that. Uh, there's a recognition that it's created uh, con constraints and in terms of uh, you know pushing the, the capacity limits uh, to welcome, to properly welcome uh, all those newcomers. Um, so, uh, but what we're saying as well is that we have to be careful not to swing the pendulum too too far out on the other side because we need these workers. We need uh, uh, that population because pop the aging of the population, that's something that just remains, it won't disappear. You alluded to it, but there's a lot of obviously conversation and debate around Canada's immigration policy. The federal government imposed a two year gap on a two year cap, sorry, on international students. How do you think this is going to impact Canada's future economic growth? Well, I think for now, they're being uh, very uh, light about this. I think they're conscious, they, they have a conscience to the effect that uh, in many localities in particular, those workers are a godsend. And there are the reasons, uh, there are the reasons some businesses are still operating today. If they 
hadn't, if they, they, they weren't able to find, say, in agriculture, right. where uh, we saw during the pandemic, a, a lot of Canadians without a job went to work in agriculture and would stay for a day because of how hard it is to work in that kind of sector. So, you know, uh, those uh, migrants, uh, they're helping us uh, in, in a very significant way. So we want to avoid, uh, you know, throwing the proverbial baby uh, out in the bathwater. But at the same time, uh, in major cities, and the, the fact is that migrants tend to converge to major cities, and that's the same way internationally speaking, uh, it's creating uh, significant uh, housing issues uh, at a time when you have a, uh, a homelessness issue uh, rent prices are continuing to go up very fast. You look at housing prices, housing prices are roughly three and a half percent year over year, but rent, we're talking more around 8%. So that's where really the affordability challenge has migrated is through the rent, in, in the rent space. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the immigration. It almost sounds like a bit of a catch 22 in that you want to put more restrictions on the immigration numbers to ensure that we can properly accommodate for all of them. But at the same time, there's businesses that are dependent on it. I know in a recent Desjardins right economics report, you talked about some of the consequences, negative consequences of restricting immigration to Canada. I would love to kind of hear more about that and, and how that could potentially impact Canada's future economic growth. Right. Well, uh, and, you know, if we were to you know, really significantly crack down, what it means is that, you know, many sectors would, would no longer have available workers. They would uh, be able to, it would be, they would have to close shops. And that's in an environment where, as we speak, uh, delinquencies and, and bankruptcies and solvencies are going up uh, because of the expiration of certain support programs like the, uh, the uh, you know, the pandemic uh, emergency program, uh, those loans expired and many businesses couldn't do without. Um, and, and, and also when we think about, uh, you know, the, the, the future and uh, the need, for example, uh, for skilled workers to assist in building Canada, we need more housing, we need significant more housing as we speak, the construction industry has a significant uh, shortage of, of workers. Uh, you know, in the next, next 10 years, 20% of workers will be retiring. Uh, we actually need more immigrants in that specific industry, not less. So that's why it's important to optimize and to be very, you can't look at it, you know, you can make a blanket decision. You have to be case by case. I would argue what Canada needs is a smarter immigration uh, strategy, not necessarily uh, lower numbers. If we have lower but smarter, then you know we're we've already make uh, a difference because uh, healthcare, education, construction, those are areas that, uh, and especially construction when you think about housing, but also the green transition that's going to require lots of of workers. So if anything, we need more. But maybe in areas where uh, we have uh, right now maybe a surplus of of, uh, of workers and job vacancies are, are way down, uh, and they tend to be overrepresented in immigrants. That's where you want to adjust things a little bit. Now to shift over to another hot topic in technology, but I'm not sure how many Canadians have actually thought about how it's going to impact the economy. It's artificial intelligence. There's been a lot of regulatory scrutiny on AI of late. Where do you predict regulations might be passed and how could this impact businesses that are utilizing AI? It's a, it's a very important question because uh, it's not a matter of, of, of if, it's a matter of when uh, regulations will be put in place and, and to what extent they will affect uh, the evolution of the technology. We know that uh, AI uh, is very powerful, but uh, it's a double-edged sword. So uh, it can create uh, lots of, of disruption. It can affect lives. It can affect the financial system. So there are uh, cybersecurity risks involved in it. There's um, uh, ethical uh, data theft, identity theft issues uh, that are made more prominent, that existed, but are, are even more prominent now that you have a technology that's so powerful. So, so regulation, as in anything, is always playing catch up. But you have a number of summits internationally, uh, uh, you know, including in the U.S. and Europe. And I think more and more what you're going to find is a cohesive international approach and a set of guidelines to uh, provide some boundaries on what 
uh, we want as a society this technology to to do and not to do. Uh, you know, and even within the industry, the AI industry itself, uh, the big proponent of the Elon Musk's, uh, the Sam Altman, you know, all those guys are sounding the alarm uh, because I mean they're competing against each other, but they they recognize that this could go overboard. If you, you provide these systems with too much power, we lose control. If we lose control as, as human beings, we create a sort of monster and it seems like the stuff of science fiction, but it's the reality. We don't no longer laugh at this, but if you create technology that's so much more intelligent than human beings uh, and that we therefore can't control. In the history of planet Earth, there has never been a species that has been controlled by a species less intelligent than it. So that's uh, that that should give us pause and there needs to be some boundaries, kind of like in cloning, right? Uh, in cloning, even if the capability was there, there was a decision, a concerted decision to say, that's where we stop because there could be, this could, you know, go overboard and the negative consequences could way exceed the positive ones. To take a look at the future, but not too distant future, which sectors of the economy or which industries do you think could be most affected by the emergence of artificial intelligence? Well, it's this is a very important question in economics uh, right now because uh, it has the power. You know, AI has the power to disrupt lots of lots of jobs. So, for example, there was a, a study by the IMF in January. They looked at uh, percentage of exposure. So, you know, for uh, uh, any given job, you know, the share of tasks that could be completed by AI, the more uh, a certain occupation has those tasks, the more it is exposed. But they also look, and that's the difference from prior studies, is that they add also a complementarity element. Uh, and they look at, okay, well, if the job, a lot of tasks can be carried out by AI, is it still more in a complementary fashion or, or an outright replacement fashion. And one example of a high exposure but high complementary is the judges. Like judges, a lot of the, the data mining or information gathering can be conducted by AI, but it's not tomorrow morning that we're going to let a judge decide the uh, important issues. So it's more a complement. But jobs like economists, <laughs> The research found that economists have uh, a lot of tasks that could be re actually replaced. So that was very interesting. So, uh, you know, you have jobs like like telemarketing uh, that are going to be very exposed uh, in jobs that are very routine uh, and uh, and for which, you know, AI could provide low level assistance and, you know, for which the human being wouldn't have too much of a uh, a need uh, or purpose, uh, you're going to have those jobs that are going to be uh, exposed. The thing is, and that's the same thing with all technologies, is that they also create jobs. And we often, often the media, you know, uh, presents the negative aspects to it, but there's also the positives that you're, we're going to need, uh, for example, a new job that could be created as a prompt engineer, uh, people who specialize in harnessing and, and utilizing uh, the technology as optimally a, as possible. And, you know, those skills are going to be in high demand, they're going to earn a lot of money. Um, uh, so those that will benefit, that will have jobs that do benefit from from AI, they they might also be more productive. That means higher wages, and that spills over through the economy. So uh, the economics research is trying to grapple with, with with all of those things, and it's very difficult because it's very uncertainty. You don't have certainty about the path of the technology, uh, how much crackdown there will be ultimately from from regulation, uh, and also how uh, the technologies will, uh, you know, the uh, spillovers. You see that in every technology. We could argue, for example, when the iPhone came out, it was just you know uh, a sexier version of the BlackBerry. But really, what made the iPhone what it is? It's the app system. So it's the inventions that surround the actual technology. And, you know, throughout history, that's what's been found to be really the major breakthrough in society and economics and productivity. And, you know, it's unknowable in advance, but we will see some spillovers, some completely new and novel ways of functioning, of doing things. And there's going to be fortunes that are going to be made out of this. Uh, and, and and so I, I think I see it really positively from 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 that from that perspective, 
but it's going to require uh, to be uh, safe, uh, first and foremost. You mentioned in a previous section of this conversation some of the challenges that Canada has in terms of productivity. How do you think AI could contribute to Canadian productivity, either for better or for worse? Well, I, I think uh, AI, there, there's going to be many apl applications um, uh, just uh, in terms of uh, be able to uh, help in decision making, and really, that's that's what sets AI apart from other technological innovations. It's not just that it replaces you know, the kind of lower skilled routine tasks. It's it's going after the you know highly educated people, and those tasks are, are being carried out very competently by by AI. Uh, but you know, like like I mentioned, there will be other humans will still be useful. Like we won't see an AI uh, dancer alongside Taylor Swift, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's still going to be done by, by a human. But uh, I'm thinking uh, of how AI itself will combine with, you know, other breakthroughs. We're thinking about robotics right now. And if you look online, you're going to see tons of videos on how the technology has, how far the technology has come, how developed it is. And, you know, when we combine AI with robotics and, you know, the, the robot, the very intelligent robot that's going to be commercialized, we're very soon, uh, you know, we're going to see that very soon. Um, and that's going to be a, a game changer if they're cheap, if they're effective, if they they help people uh, either in household chores or, you know, businesses on uh, factory floors, businesses are dealing with uh, labor shortages. I mean, this could be a major uh, a breakthrough and help us in, in many dimensions. The other thing is uh, to look forward is the uh, combination of AI and uh, the green transition, uh, because uh, there's going to be many applications, be it uh, when you talk about uh, energy efficiency and be it about uh, agriculture uh, and management and, and optimizing uh, yields, uh, but also reducing uh, water usage, uh, those kind of things, determine in transportation, determining the uh, optimal routes uh, and, and modes of, of shipping, for example, to reduce emissions. So there's going to be many applications. There's a the word intelligence and artificial intelligence. So it's going to make us uh, much more aware and it's going to be able to take decisions as well that uh, will benefit uh, society. So I'm looking, I'm very optimistic about the, uh, about the application. And, uh, you know, Canada right now is an economy that sorely needs more productivity. Uh, and, and the good thing, the positive thing about Canada is that we have uh, the AI skills I discussed, you know, we have, uh, uh, either in Montreal or Toronto, the expertise that Canada has is uh, it could be envied by many countries. So we're in a good position to not only harness the technology, but also contribute and generate businesses that will profit from that, that will export internationally, given uh, the human capital that we have here. You mentioned before that the implementation of AI is going to create new jobs, new jobs that we might not have known of or thought of before. What are these emerging roles and how can Canada prepare its workforce for the shift? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the one I mentioned, uh, uh, prompt engineer, uh, uh, you know, the, that specialized in understanding how to best optimize the, because, uh, you know, you, you could argue it's garbage and garbage now, you know, if you, you, you ask it something foolish, it's going to return something foolish. Uh, but you're going to have that. You're going to have also uh, jobs that are, are going to focus on applying AI into certain specific sectors, uh, be it the, the, the financial industry. Uh, healthcare, I think it's big, it's huge, because this is a, a very inefficient uh, sector, very costly uh, from a budget perspective. And there's you know so many gains that could be made for, uh, from AI. And we're not talking about necessarily a robot nurse, but just in terms of the, the data intelligence, data gathering, uh, there's a lot of routine within healthcare, you know, checklists, things like that. And AI technology is very well suited to carry out those tasks. And in some case, even more with more precision than, than a human being could, could have. Uh, so that could be a big game changer because we know healthcare is the, you know, the top or among the top uh, spending line for governments in, in, in Canada. Uh, so, so those jobs, those jobs that will uh, be figuring out how to best apply and also uh, how to 
uh, for example, uh, even when we, we think about regulation, regulating AI, you're going to need AI to regulate AI, sure. you know, you get to, to be able to, to keep up. So you're going to have all sorts of jobs. Governments are going to be looking for experts uh, to be able to match up with what you're going to see in the private sector. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, considering AI's potential impact on infrastructure and energy and the green transition, what role does AI play in Canada's sustainability and innovation efforts? I, I think it's a big. Uh, it, it's 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 going to be a big game changer. Not just in Canada; it's going to be elsewhere. And then, and you know, the I think we're going to see a lot of, of diffusion across across borders. Uh, you know, across the U.S. Same thing. We saw with the personal computer revolution in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so those technologies, I mean, they're already uh, available now uh, in Canada, and, and they're, they're, they're going to diffuse uh, very rapidly. And, and so when uh, we, uh, you know, businesses start to implement them or are or, or, or trying to find use cases, that's where, you know, new ideas will emerge, uh, new, um, new business, new ideas that can be, uh, marketed that can be sold and uh, the opportunities to cr generate new business startups will be just amplified by, by by these new technologies combined with the fact that we have the the, the expertise so I think uh, the the future from that perspective uh, does look very bright but again we need to have all the conditions in place and that means um, having you know uh, a, a startup system that's uh, that's encouraging uh, with the right incentives, the right government incentives. Uh, we need to have, you know, lower financing costs. Uh, we'll, we're going to get that hopefully, but that's going to help also uh, with uh, businesses that need to invest, that need to to deploy capital. We know there's a ton of money going into AI right now, so uh, so that's good. But uh, you know, we're going to need also governments to 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 assist. And to steer uh, a little bit the uh, uh, the development towards uh, useful purposes in society, uh, like I said, uh, healthcare being one of them, and also the green transition, the top priorities for not just for the next couple of years, but the next decades. Yeah, that's a really interesting point to end it off on. I, I never thought about that. How AI is going to impact that broader green transition that we've been talking a lot for these past few years. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. This was a really great conversation. I always enjoy these conversations and uh, we'll see you on the next one.